Taiwan is bursting with heaps of fun places to explore. Join me, Amber Hatfield, as I hit up travel hotspots, soak up some culture, and hunt down hidden gems. Let's go! Welcome back to Let's Go. In this week's episode, I will be talking again with Sally Jensen. This is part two of our conversation. But in the first part, we talked about hitchhiking. So if you missed that, you can head back to last Sunday's episode and hear Sally talking all about her experiences of hitchhiking in Taiwan and other places too. Today, we'll be focusing on other activities that Sally's done in Taiwan, like diving and also working on a farm. So it's going to be quite an interesting episode. Let's get into it. Now I kind of want to hear a little bit more about some of your other experiences that you've had in Taiwan. So mm. you told me before that you have spent a month diving with indigenous people mm. in, is it Green Island? Orchid. Orchid, Orchid Island. Island. Okay, yeah. so I would love to hear about this and if this was like an organized thing or if you kind of just met people through friends and this kind of ended up happening or <laughs> how, how did this occur? Yeah, um, this was the second time I came to Taiwan as on a working holiday visa oh. um, and so I knew I wanted to spend an extensive amount in ta- of time in Taiwan and actually this was peak COVID so COVID had hit and I ended up staying in Taiwan longer than I'd expected and so I was kind of traveling around Taiwan and then I met somebody who had just been to Orchid Island and had just kind of spent some time with the indigenous people who live there and obviously Orchid Island is quite a um, touristy place a lot of people go diving there but it's also very cultural in that you have all this indigenous culture it's the Dao people um, who are actually you know getting to know them they actually feel more familiar or close to the Batanes, people who live on the Batanes or other Aboriginal people um, who have kind of spread all that. They say, you know, that they are the original Aboriginal people because they have um, spread across, you know, Australia and even as far as Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And the language that they share can be quite similar and also the boats that they make and all this kind of stuff. So I heard this from my friend who had been there, but she had been like... um, wild camping okay and then she met uh this local man who uh, who basically was like you shouldn't be wild camping because they don't really like people camping they they have a lot of kind of um i guess beliefs or customs um where you know there's a lot of respect for the sea and knowledge of how powerful and how dangerous it can get in the wild so he basically um took her in he had this uh because a lot of the indigenous people there live on tourism, live off tourism. And so um, he had a kind of hostel or guest house. And so she stayed with him and, and helped him out with a few things. And he was also a tour guide and diver. And so when she told me this and I was like, wow, I didn't realize that I could go diving in Taiwan, scuba diving in Taiwan. And she was like, yeah, it's beautiful there. Like she had a snorkel. She said, really beautiful, pristine water. So I was like, oh, I've got to go. And so she gave me the contact of this guy. And then I just, uh, I went and I got in touch with him. And I said, is it okay if I stay for a while? I'd like to get to know the island. And he said, sure, because he knew my friend. So um, yeah, I ended up going and, and spending a month there. And it happened to be a month where they were doing this kind of annual beach cleanup that's organized by not sorry not beach cleanup ocean ocean cleanup that's organized by the local government and they ask the indigenous tour guides business people whoever can scuba dive basically to go to the bottom of the ocean near the coastline and pick up as much plastic as they can get which is you know mostly fishing gear (laughs) ghost gear um and so because I was able to scuba dive, he said, you, you can come along as like a volunteer and help us out. And I was like, that's amazing, you know, <laughs> free diving. <laughs> um, and, you know, a lot of it because he was doing it every single day. They were supposed to be doing this every single day for about a month. 
um, and he got tired sometimes or had to lead a tour group or something or, you know, had guests or whatever. So he was like, you can do it on my behalf. Because, so you know, they they are busy, you know, these guys. It's not something that they can really take time out of their day and their business time to go and do, even though they try. But yeah, it was basically that. That's how I got there. It sounds like a really interesting thing to do. So did you actually get to see much of the like wildlife or you were mainly just cleaning stuff up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I mean, part of it as well, I am, um, as I'm very interested in climate and ecological issues, this was an area of Taiwan that I really wanted to get to know, especially when I heard about how pristine the sea was and how beautiful the corals were and everything. And so I was like, wow, uh, I'm, I have to see this. And yeah, it was probably the most pristine diving site in Taiwan that I've been to. Um, I've since dived uh, near Kenting as well, but Orchid Island was by far the best. Um, but again, I think everywhere that I have dived um, in different places, it hasn't really lived up to my expectations. I think when you grow up, you see all these beautiful photos of like abundant, abundant coral reefs and vibrant, you know, schools of fish and everything. And while there was some of that, there was a lot of, um, you know, small, uh, beautiful, um, how do you call it, like microbiology, marine ecosystems, but there was also, yeah, a lot of bleaching. And that was very depressing for me. And, you know, um, a lot of it is caused by a lot of the tourists who come and, and you know, are always touching the corals and all this stuff. But mm -hmm. the major cause, uh, of course, is the rising sea temperatures. And I think, I mean, Taiwan has actually done a pretty good job of keeping its marine ecosystems quite healthy in general. Um, so it really is something that is not necessarily can be solved just by kind of local government initiatives or things like that and I, I know that the the indigenous people who live there they've historically historically lived from the sea you know mm -hmm. doing a lot of fishing and so they've really seen the changes and the way that uh, there was especially that year that I went was peak COVID so it was mass domestic tourism there was this huge spike in tourists who arrived uh, tens of thousands in just one month I think in August and you know the amount of trash that that brought as well as the amount of pollution and all this other kind of stuff they were a little bit um, kind of just not very happy about that of course you know and we're a little bit not antagonistic but a bit wary about the foreigners not the foreigners sorry um the Taiwanese or any tourists really who came to Orchid Island and you know just for a day and ran around the island left a bunch of trash and then went back to their homes mm, yeah yeah so how did you find that the experience that you had there in Orchid Island with those indigenous people? Did you feel like it kind of brought you closer to understanding how they live there on Orchid Island mm. or kind of understanding the indigenous culture more? Yeah, totally. I mean, the other side of it was that I was only pretty much so the guys who were doing this diving and ocean cleanup thing, they were all men. And so I was the only woman and I was a foreigner. So I did wonder, you know, why are the women? not getting involved in mm -hmm. this there was um another uh kind of youngish girl but she was uh from mainland taiwan and she had come as like a diving instructor and so she helped out she was really awesome as well um so i didn't really get to know the women very much okay. um and i feel perhaps this is part of their culture you know where the men go out to sea and the women as far as i had heard really um picked um the gua what do you call it um, sweet, potato. sweet potato and taro and those things um, so I guess the male side of things you know also the that they, they have these special like resting gazebos that look out onto the sea and um, I'm not sure if women are really supposed to go on them so it was a little bit uh, strange in that sense I definitely felt like an outsider but um, I was very welcomed and I got to sit with them and you know eat with them and drink with them so that was a lot of fun yeah. yeah okay and I'm sure another experience that you've had where you've been able to maybe get more deeply into a certain area would be when you went to Nantou you said mm -hmm. that you had worked for a month 
mm. on a, a farm in Nanto. Yeah. How did that come about? <laughs> and can you tell me about this experience? Because is, was this like a woofing kind of like organic farm volunteering type thing or? Sort of, yeah. Um, I mean, again, the people who I went, they were very surprised that some random foreigner had just kind of got in touch and asked if she could join in whatever they were doing. Okay. Um, again, it was the same time I was traveling around Taiwan and I wanted to spend, you know, at least a month in each place that I was in. And so I was just looking on Facebook, in Facebook groups, actually, for this kind of experience where I could be on maybe on any kind of farm that I could just help out and mm -hmm. get my hands dirty and learn <laughs> the basics of, of life. And and um, I met this, uh, well, this girl got in touch and she said, I'm going to be doing a kind of woofing thing. If you want, uh, you can join me. I did had no idea who she was, so it was kind of a bit sketch, but okay. <laughs> But she told me where it was and, and yeah, and then I met her there. Again, I hitchhiked up to this complete out in the woods place in Nanto and uh, the family was super lovely and they really lived, it was virtually off grid at this point. They had come from, I can't remember which city, I think Taichung and they were now setting up their own little spot on top of like this mountain and yeah and so they were still in the setting up stages okay. so what was really great about that was like I learned how to chop wood and like start a fire and these are the most basic human Skills. kind of abilities yeah. but I was like I've never felt so useful in my <laughs> life like this is the best skill I've ever learned and yeah we had to heat up our own water to have a shower and all this stuff and it was really interesting to see because they were trying to do organic farming mm. I picked bamboo and we cooked it and it was just such a, an interesting experience and I'm still in touch with them they're such a lovely family right so how are they now are they up and running with their organic farm already <laughs> I think so yeah yeah I think that things got a lot smoother because obviously you have a lot of hurdles in the first few years mm -hmm. um but then once you're able to really get a flow on things, then yeah, I think their kids have kind of grown up more. So their kids have gone down to study in the city, but who knows, maybe in a few years time, they'll come back and help mum and dad. Mm, yeah, it sounds like you've had so many interesting experiences in Taiwan. I wish I had time to listen to more of them. <laughs> I know you've also hiked quite a lot of the mountains over 3000 meters in Taiwan as well. Mm. So maybe if we have time, you can come back on another episode <laughs> and tell me all about that. I would love to. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's all we've got time for for today's episode of Let's Go. Don't forget to come back and join me next Sunday. See you there.